Okay. Okay, well, thanks very much, everybody, for coming to listen to the talk in the lovely Flowers Auditorium. Uh, my name's Ken Toon, and uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about bringing your relational data into MarkLogic. Um, how do you do that, and why do you do that? Uh, so here's the, the agenda to the talk, a uh, brief introduction to myself. Um, and then to kick us off, I'll talk a little bit about the why, and I'll be talking to you about uh, the operational data hub idea that you'll be hearing about during your two days here. We'll move on to that to discussing modeling data within the MarkLogic database. And then pretty much the core of the talk is three worked examples demonstrating different migration patterns that you might encounter when you're moving uh, your data from a relational system into MarkLogic little uh, section at the end about BI tool integration, uh, wrap up, and then hopefully there should be uh, some time for questions at the end. Okay, so uh, my name's Ken Toon. I'm a member of the consultancy team here at MarkLogic. Um, I've worked for MarkLogic for approximately five years now, and uh, during that time I've worked for a wide variety of customers across multiple verticals, helping them solve a wide variety of different business problems. And probably like many of you in the room today, prior to joining MarkLogic, I've had substantial experience in working with relational systems, um, and that's stood me in good stead when I've come to help customers deploy and move to MarkLogic. Uh, as I said, this is predominantly a, a practical talk in nature. I'll be showing a demonstration. There's some source code behind that demonstration. You probably won't have time to actually memorize it during the talk, so if you do want to access it subsequently, it's available on GitHub. Come speak to me afterwards if you, if you don't make a note of that URL. Uh, so we've been... Uh, we're introducing this idea this week, and we've already sort of started talking to people about it already. The idea of MarkLogic as an operational data hub. And we believe that MarkLogic is the ideal technology for integrating data from multiple heterogeneous standalone sources or silos, which is the convenient shorthand we often use for that terminology. Uh, we believe that if you have this sort of arrangement in place, bring all your data into one place, then you'll be able to do more with that data in aggregate. If you bring it into MarkLogic specifically, then you'll be able to make use of MarkLogic's feature sets, such as semantics, uh, real-time indexing, uh, tiered storage, search, et cetera, et cetera. And it kind of goes without saying that if you are bringing silos into a central repository, then some of those silos are going to be RDBMSs. Um, MarkLogic is a document database. So the question arises, how do we go from tables to documents. Okay, so in order to understand that question, we need to understand the two sides of the equation, if you will, tables on one hand and documents on the other. I won't dwell on tables because I think everybody is um, it's very familiar with the concept of tables, and the perfect adjective for describing them is tabular, right? So um, if you if you understand that word, then no further explanation is, is, is necessary. If you aren't, then they look, they look like spreadsheets. That's the um, way I describe tables to, to non-technical people. Documents potentially um, need a little more by way of uh, explanation because they're not necessarily as familiar up front. So doc uh, documents are tree structures. They're sometimes referred to as acyclic graphs. And two of their key characteristics are that they're, they're hierarchical in nature and they're nested. Uh, they have... They have a higher dimension than, ta than tables do. So tables are very obviously two-dimensional. Trees obviously have kind of more dimensions than that, probably an, an infinite number. I, I don't know. I haven't actually counted. But because they do have a higher dimension, they have greater expressive powers. Despite the fact that the two things are very different beasts, there is um, a sort of natural intuitive way of moving from one to the other, and I'll be talking about that. But what you shouldn't do is necessarily regard this as a mechanical exercise because documents do have greater expressive powers. There are some additional possibilities that you gain and you, you, you would essentially do well to, to, to use those. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a number of ways why uh, so documents offer increased expressive capability, but I'm going to focus on entities and relationships. So if you have ever designed an application, then thinking about entities and relationships will be something that you have done. They're basically the two key things that make up any uh, conceptual model you might have for your, uh, for your application. And I want to talk about um, relationships in particular in a, in a bit more detail. So on this slide, you've got a very small taxonomy of the different sorts of uh, relationships you will encounter or formulate when modeling your application. So the first type of relationship is an association relationship. Um, and the characteristics of that relationship are the things on either side of the arrow are independent. And the things on either side of the arrow have equal parity or equal rank. An example of 
an association relationship would be a person knows another person or a person um, works with another person. Um, the second type of relationship um, that I'm going to describe is an aggregation relationship. Um, and in an aggregation relationship, uh, both sides are independent, but they don't necessarily have equal rank. So if you consider uh, the relationship person owns car, car is the, the, the lesser part of that relationship, if you will. And then the third type of relationship I'd like you to consider is a, a composition relationship. And in a composition relationship, the thing on the right doesn't have um, independence. It belongs to the thing on the left. And an example of that is uh, the aliases that uh, a person might, might have to use to, to log into uh, different websites. Um, those aliases kind of cease to exist or cease to be useful if the, the person object on the, on the left-hand side uh, ceases to exist. Um, and the, the, the reason I'm telling you about all of this is that if you model these relationships in a relational system, what you'll do is you'll create tables for all the things on the right, and then you'll join to the things on the left. And that's kind of just the way that you have to do things. Um, and a lot of the time, that will be a good thing to do and probably the right thing to do, the best thing to do. But you don't necessarily have any choice. And modeling things in documents does actually give you that element of choice. And you know, I think we can all agree that choices are always good. Um, so documents offer greater flexibility. So on this slide, um, I've modeled relationships in two ways. In some instances, the relationships are inside the documents. So um, for instance, I've collapsed the composition alias relationship inside the document. But nevertheless, I've continued to preserve some of the relationships between documents. So I've exercised my choice. And what we believe is that what you end up with is something that is much more intuitive. So rather than having your data kind of sprinkled around different tables, you've got it all in one place. It's more natural. As it happens, modeling data in this way does actually have functional benefits in terms of your actual design of the application. So we'll talk about that a little later. And then something which you wouldn't necessarily pick out immediately is that um, what I'm doing in this very small diagram is I'm accommodating heterogeneous data. So if I brought in different person data, different types of person data, if you will, from different systems, this shows that I can very easily sort of absorb it and, and categorize it in a natural, intuitive way. Um, and in passing, I will say that I could have used uh, triples to model some of the data, but that's outside of, of, of today's uh, talk. But talks on triples and semantics um, are available um, over the next couple of days. Um, so I'm um, just kind of stepping up a level of abstraction, if you will. If you use a document database, there's actually advantages in addition to um, using documents. Um, some of these advantages are enumerated here. Um, the first is that when you run a query in a document database, it runs across the entire database. So you don't have to say up front which table you want your query to run against, which means that you don't have to have a priori knowledge of your content, which means that you don't so potentially miss things, I guess. Um, when you bring content into MarkLogic, you can allocate data to collections, which you can think of as being kind of buckets for your data. And this allows flexible creation of non-invasive taxonomies. Um, so what that kind of means in layman's terms is that you can categorize your data without, without polluting it, which is what people you know, often really don't want to do. They don't want to change the data that they're bringing in. Um, MarkLogic is a, a schema agnostic data set, database, which means that we can bring different data sets in without modeling them up front. And again, that small diagram on the, on the previous slide with the, with the persons kind of you know, made that sort of hopefully reasonably explicit, which allows load of disparate data sets. The support for metadata or data describing data. If you're bringing data in from multiple sources, you're probably going to want something that actually describes the data itself. MarkLogic via things like properties fragments and triples uh, will accommodate that. Um, and then the final thing is extensive support for data transformation. So when you're moving data around, you're often sort of changing it from one thing into the other, and, and MarkLogic can support you sort of very well um, in that regard. Um, so that's the, uh, the sort of opening part of the talk. So just to recap, the sort of scenario we're trying to accommodate is a scenario where you have multiple standalone sources of data. You want to bring it all into one location. You can do that by bringing it into MarkLogic. The unit of store in MarkLogic is the document. So how do we go from tables to documents? Um, OK, we're going to be using something called the uh, Sequila data set. If you download and install uh, MySQL, you get the Sequila data set automatically installed. Um, it represents a DVD rental store. So you could argue it's slightly showing its age at this point. But the reason it's there in um, MySQL is that it showcases MySQL functionality. Um, and because it does that, it's a sort of perfect 
test bed, if you will, for exploring uh, different migration techniques. Uh, entity relationship diagram derived from the Sequila data set. Uh, so one of the important things is thinking about entities and relationships. Entity relationship diagrams, you know, I mean, that's, that, that's their job, as, as the name suggests. Um, we'll be using this diagram to sort of help us understand the individual pieces of migration that we're doing um, as, the, as the talk progresses. Um, so these are always kind of very, very useful things uh, to have. And people sometimes think kind of bra brave new world, you know, new, new paradigm. But, you know, assets like this will come in very handy when you come to, uh, to sort of analyse your migration needs and actually to exercise them in practice. Uh, so, the important thing when moving from tables to documents is, one, you need to understand the data modelling options in MarkLogic, and then on the application design side, um, you need to understand the entities that you're working with. So, we'll explore those two topics over the next few slides. Um, so, data modelling in MarkLogic. MarkLogic is a document-oriented database, um, as you will know by this point, um, and you can model data in any form via um, trees via acyclic graphs. It's a very flexible way of modelling your data. Uh, important thing about documents, they all have universal resource identifiers. That's what a U URI stands for. Um, so a URI is uh, a unique string for identifying your document. And you can think of it as being very much like uh, a primary key, but its scope is the database rather than being a table, because MarkLogic doesn't have tables, um, for a start. Um, that's a good sort of intuitive way of thinking about them. Um, and in terms of how you create your, uh, your URI, uh, there's sort of various ways you can do it, and because it's a, it's a free string, in a sense, you're free to do it in, in any way. Um, but what people will often try and do when they're bringing content into MarkLogic is they'll, they'll kind of make use of the techniques that they're already familiar with. Um, one of those is sequence numbers, um, a sort of you know, I guess a lesson learned is that sequence numbers, if you're bringing data in from multiple sources, don't tend to work terribly well because of the risk of clashes, because pretty much everybody will start from one, right? So there'll be a one and a two in every single, you know, data set that you're bringing in. And, you know, you can be careful, but there will probably be clashes. Uh, preferable to use a universally unique identifier, which is what UUID stands for. Um, most application development environments will have a function which will generate those for you. Um, MarkLogic is no, uh, no different in that regard. So this function you can use, um, other, other functions are available as it happens. When you're creating your URI, as I've said, you can kind of name your document in any way, um, but what we tend to do is we tend to name them in a way that makes them look like files, although they're they're not files. Um, advantages to naming them in this way is that, firstly, you know, the URI kind of gives you something a little bit intuitive to bite on. So I look at this and I know, I know it's a film, right, which is more useful than if it was a, a hex string. Um, and secondly, there are some functions um, that can be scoped to directories. So, for example, you can search across a given directory or you can scope the activities of triggers to a specific directory. So creating your URIs in this manner is often a very sensible and useful thing to do, although you are kind of completely free, in a sense, to do as you please. Um, other things you need to think about when bringing your content into MarkLogic, you need to think about the, uh, the collections that it should go in. And so sort of as noted previously, collections are basically a way of categorizing your data and they're stored as metadata so they don't sit um, in the data itself. A document can belong to zero to many uh, collections, so they're very flexible. And collections um, are often contrasted with directories. And the difference between collections and directories is that Directories support mutually exclusive relationships because a document can only be in one particular directory, right? And that can be useful as well because it may be that you only want a document to actually occupy one of a given set of categories. For instance, a document um, should only have one entity type. It can only have come from one source system. So you can use directories uh, to help you enforce that type of relationship. And then the final thing that you really need to think about before bringing your content into MarkLogic is the security information that you associate with your content. So strictly speaking, you can insert your content without assigning it any security information whatsoever, but the, um, the consequence of that will be that uh, 
if you're not an administrator, you won't actually be able to see that data. So if you do it that way, what you will end up doing is granting admin privileges to people just so they can see the data and then they have admin privileges and you're not going to want that. So you're going to go back and refactor and you're probably going to slightly wish that you'd actually done it properly to start off with. So, you know, lesson learned is do it properly to start off with. Um, Aside some security uh, information to your documents, and later on I'll say more explicitly uh, what that involves. Um, so we talked about data modeling. Um, the next thing is more sort of about standard object-oriented thinking, if you will. Um, to identify entities, the thing you should do is just you know, think about how you talk about your system, and in particular, um, you know, what is it that users are going to want to do with your system? And then the sort of traditional method of analysis is to extract nouns from you know, that sort of inner or possibly external conversation that you might have. Um, take our data set, for example. It's a, a DVD rental store. Um, so as a customer, you know, if I'm using a DVD rental store search application, then I probably want to search for films that have certain actors in. Um, as a customer, I want to find a store with a particular film. Um, as a staff member, I want to find overdue rentals. So this is very much a sort of pre-Netflix pre uh, data set. Um, and you can see that just having um, this kind of, you know, slightly internal conversation or slightly external, I suppose. Um, we've already identified some of, the, some of the entities that we're going to be thinking about, films, actors, stores, et cetera, et cetera. And this sort of particularly informs uh, discussion vis-a-vis -vis MarkLogic because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between um, entities and the, and the collections. So for every entity type, there should be a corresponding uh, collection in MarkLogic. Okay, so um, moving on to the sort of practical section of the talk. Um, this talk was predominantly built using something called uh, the MarkLogic slush generator. Um, and a slush generator is a way of generating so sort of an application shell or scaffold, and then you know the individual application development team can put the bit that's specific to them sort of in the heart of that application. So most of the you know the, the same work that you do over and over again is done for you by the slush generator. Um, it is available um, on GitHub if you want to uh, make use of it. So we, we make use of it for building a considerable number of our own demonstrations. Um, in this talk, we'll be using a slight adaptation, and the adaptation is that um, the, the first uh, the first framework uses Node.js as its middle tier, whereas um, the second modified framework has a Java middle tier. And the reason we've made that substitution for this talk is that we're wanting to use something called uh, Spring Batch um, to help us migrate data. And Spring Batch is part of the Spring ecosystem, which is a Java-based ecosystem. So if we want to use it, then we need to make that sort of middle, middle tier change, um, which is what we've done. Here. It actually doesn't change the structure uh, that much. Um, if you sort of download the source code, you'll be able to see that the, the middle tier is actually quite thin, and it, it deals predominantly with proxying and um, so the, the management of uh, authentication. So actually kind of sw swapping that for a Java middle tier isn't so, such a big deal because a lot of the uh, activity of the application is actually client-side based, and as it happens, it's uh, been constructed using AngularJS. Um, little bit of comment about Spring Batch. So, you know, there's a whole world of um, ETL or extract, transform, and load tools out there. There's commercial ones, uh, there's free ones. We've selected Spring Batch um, because it's Java based, as we've said. It's part of the Spring ecosystem, so it's, it's tried and tested. And, you know, it's, it's stuff that folks have worked with before as well, so it's a good fit for us. Um, using something that's part of the Java ecosystem so it makes good sense when thinking about it in MarkLogic terms because there's a substantial amount of the kind of satellite content um, of MarkLogic that's actually part of, you know, in the Java ecosystem. Um, examples include the MarkLogic Java client API and also the, uh, the, the content pump, which is the tool that you use for pushing sort of industrial quantities of data into your application. Um, for those of you who sort of like architecture diagrams and, and so forth, there's a sort of relatively small but descriptive one here. In terms of what we'll be doing, um, we've obviously got the MySQL database. Then we've got the Spring Batch component. And what that will do is it will retrieve rows, essentially, from the SQL database. And those rows will be scoped by a query that we supply. What Spring Batch will then do is it will then, for each row, it will create an XML document. And for each column um, in the data that we retrieve, it will uh, generate a corresponding element. Uh, the documents will be passed to uh, the MarkLogic Java client API one by one. That will then wrap them up into a batch and write them all across to MarkLogic. Um, 
so there's going to be three uh, migrations, um, as, I, as I said. Let's check my time. Um, and as you, you, know, you won't be surprised to hear that we'll kind of start simple and uh, sort of get more sort of complex. So the first migration that we're going to do is um, bringing in data from the actor table. Um, so it's very simple um, in terms of what we're, what we're bringing in. It's in terms of scoping the data, we're just going to do select star from actor. Um, in terms of the modeling we're going to put in place, actor documents are going to go in the actor collection. We're going to tag all those documents with a Sequila collection, so we note where they've come from. In terms of the way we're going to name the content, we're going to use a scheme which looks like slash entity name um, slash ID dot extension. And then in terms of the security information that we're going to associate with the document, um, standard advice is to set up two groups. So set up a group of people who can read the content and set up a group of people who can modify the content and then assign your users to those groups sort of as you will, essentially. And note that that implies the existence of a third group who can not do either of these things, right? which is actually a useful, useful thing to have um, by implication. Okay, so um, let's move on to the actual migration. So um, there's a little bit of source code here. Um, so how visible is that at the back? Uh, small. Um, so it's pretty simple in nature. We say where the data's come from. So it's come from my SQL. Um, it's specifically on my laptop. Uh, credentials. Um, where's it going to? Mark logic. Uh, the port number 8510 basically says where to send the data, and there's an application server sitting behind that. There's some security, um, ob obfuscated, incredibly cryptic security credentials there. And then the kind of guts of it is this scoping of the data, select star from actor. I'm going to create an actor document off the back of that. Here's the security information I'm, I'm adding. So the read group can read data. The write group can update data. Um, by default, uh, there will be a collection created which is the same as the root element name. I'm going to additionally add the content to a Sequila collection, as I said. And then the last line actually is the um, execution part. So before I start, I'll just sort of show you the shell that we've got. Um, so. Okay. Okay, and the important thing is that there's no data in here, right? Um, so I'm now going to run this, and this is going to bring my actor data in. Always a relief when your demo actually does something. Um, so, and then when that red light goes out, it will have done its stuff. Um, so, if we come back here and then click, got some data. I've got 200 actor documents, so they're also in the Sequila collection. Um, so, you know, this is a, a shell, right? So your search application would look more attractive than this. But it has got key things like uh, pagination. It's got a search bar. And we've loaded the data as is. So I haven't, didn't show you the original table, but pretty much had an actor ID, column, first name, last name, and a kind of timestamp column. So let's go through in a bit more detail what we just did there. Um, every column in the row became an element name. You kind of saw that. Uh, which is kind of simple, and I said that at the start, there's a simple intuitive way of doing this. And you know, simple is not necessarily bad because it definitely gives you something that you can build on. You can build more complex things on top of this. Um, we've done a certain amount of future proofing. So we can, in theory, bring in actor data from different subsystems. So we could bring in actor data from IMDB, and you could sort of 
bet your bottom dollar that it wouldn't look the same as the actor data from Sequila. And use of collections would allow us to sort of segregate but also combine information. So we acknowledge the fact that, you know, in some respects the documents are similar, but in some respects they're different, and then we can handle them appropriately. It's kind of this kind of relatively simple thing that actually enables us to sort of integrate content um, effectively. Um, so the second migration is going to be bringing in uh, the film data from the Sequila database. Um, slightly more complicated, as you can see. So here's the relevant segment of the ER diagram. The data for films is sprinkled across five different tables. Um, so the synopsis for the film is in the film text table. Um, the language associated with the film is in the language table. And the categories are dealt with via two tables, categories or, or genres. So it's kind of, you know, sort of all over the place. You could kind of describe it in that way. Um, but, you know... When you're thinking about films, in a sense, all these things kind of belong together. Um, so, A, um, the, the natural thing would seem to be to combine them together. And sort of B, if we do combine them together, it actually makes a whole lot uh, more sense from the point of view of our application development. So, that is what we're going to do. Um, so, it's just a matter of creating a different <laughs> query. And as I said previously, the, the, the query essentially scopes the data that you're bringing in. And um, if you sort of read this through, you can see essentially what we're doing is we're combining, aggregating data from different tables and just sort of bringing it all in as one unit um, and then we're, going, then we're going to create an appropriate document, put it into mock logic. Um, in terms of how that changes things from our code point of view, the act answer is it doesn't really change things very much um, and it will just look like small print anyway unless I do that. Um, so, again, where's the data come from? Where's it going? And then the bit that's changed is the, the, the data scoping part of so the, the SQL query. Um, we're bringing in a different entity type, so it says film. Everything else is pretty much the same. Uh, so, I'm going to run this. And there's a thousand films in this data set, so it will take a little bit longer. It will seem longer to me than it will to you. No, it didn't actually take that long. It's going terribly well. Um, okay, so let's see how that's changed things. Right, so, you know, it's starting to look more like a search application. Um, so, is that visible at the back? It's, it's all made up content, actually. Um, some confessionals. Um, Right, so you can see that I've got some data snippets. Um, I've got some uh, facets down the left-hand side that I pre-configured ahead of time. That's an easy thing to do. You just create um, an appropriate range index and add um, the appropriate sort of configuration. Um, I've, I've got a facet on uh, genre. Um, I've got a facet on the rating of the film. And right at the bottom, I've got a, a bucket facet. So because um, the length of the film is a continuous variable, if you're going to sort of sensibly allow the, the user uh, sort of search access to that data, then you need to put it into buckets. Um, so I can look for sort of short films, medium length films, um, greater length films. If you can't see at the back, um, so less than 90 minutes, 90 to 120 minutes, um, more than 120 minutes. Um, let's have a look at the actual content. Um, so I've kind of, the first part of this is a load data as is um, result, all the way down to the last update element. <coughs> So that's pretty much you know, what, above that what you would see in the MySQL database. And then the kind of little bit of denormalization that we've done is visible below that last update. So um, the synopsis of the film is in the film text element, and the genre of the film is in the category element, and the language of the film um, is in the language element. So that's what we've, that's what we've done. Just go through that in a bit more uh, detail. Uh, so what we did, we combined, uh, we combined five tables into a single document, and we feel that you know, what you've got there is sort of you know, more, more intuitive, if you will. Um, makes more sense from a viewing point of view. Um, pot potentially makes it easy from an updating point of view, because all the data's are in one location. Um, and from a search point of view, it, it makes things a little bit easier. So if I go back here and I search for, um, if I search for the word travel... Sports, let's try sports. Um, 
So I could have done that via a fasted search, but I can also do it via a, a, a term search as well. So you kind of don't really know which of the two things your user is going to do. So that bit of denormalization allowed me to do what I've just done. Um, yeah, and, it allowed me, and, and the combining of the data allowed me to easily build the, the facets that you saw and, you know, get to the point where we have something that looks, you know, like, like a search application. Um, draw your attention to a, a particular pattern that I invoked. Um, so when you're building your relational database, um, if you have any sort of enumeration, you will sort of traditionally put it in a separate table and then join it via some sort of ID. Um, and we've kind of disappeared that, I suppose, which we believe makes things simpler and it also has uh, functional benefits in that I can now search for all films by language just by using um, the search bar. And as to whether or not it's the sort of right thing to do, um, sort of, you know, relational theory sort of teaches us to do this, but you know, it's, it's probably a case that just because the theory sort of says you should, you know, should you, you have to consider actually sort of practically what, what makes sense. And we slightly argue that in this context, what we've done actually makes a bit more sense. And it definitely simplifies things. I mean, I think we could probably all agree um, on that. So standard advice with what you might term lookup look up data is to sort of pull it into the documents themselves, so get rid of those lookup uh, relationships. Um, and it will support your search better. Um, and yes, yes, you're moving away from the, um, the, sort of tr the traditional voice card model, um, but that's you know, not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, so the final um, migration that we're going to do is um, the sort of more uh, most sort of complex of the three. Um, so we've discussed kind of one-to-many relationships. Um, in this last migration, we're going to consider uh, many-to-many relationships. And an example of that is the relationships relationship between actors and films. So a film will usually have many actors in, and actors will usually um, appear in many films. So how do we um, how do we model that within our database, or how should we? model it within our database. Um, so in order to kind of answer that question, we should think about the way in which we're going to be using um, our application. And one thing users are probably going to want to do is they're probably going to want to find films that have a given actor in them. Um, so right now, if I go back to my application and type in UMA, um, there is exactly one UMA document, and that is the document for UMA Wood, as it happens. Um, but it doesn't find me all the corresponding films, where that's probably what I want. So that actually informs what I'm going to do next. Um, yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, denormalize our data. We're going to bring in sort of some elements of the actor data, in, in particular first name and last name of the actors. So we will be able to execute the search that I just executed, and it's actually going to give us uh, the results that we would like. Um, and in passing again, semantics is something that you could make use of um, to sort of assist you in this regard. Um, probably the case that semantics gets reserved for sort of slightly more complicated use cases still. An example of that would be, find me all films with a cast member who's won a Best Actress Oscar. You would probably struggle to do that via denormalization. Triples would probably be you know, the, the, uh, the answer to uh, requirements, sort of slightly more complex requirements um, of that nature. Um, and with denormalization, um, it's one of those things where there's not necessarily an automatic kind of right answer. There's only a variety of opinions. Um, so I guess the way to get to the, the, the best answer, which is really what you want to do, is consider you know, what your users want to do, um, practical factors. So when you denormalize, you have to consider uh, the extent to which your data might be updated. If it's going to be updated all the time, then denormalization might not be um, the tool for you. And also the, the volumes of the updates that might occur. If you're leaning towards um, not denormalizing your data, then you need to think about how efficient your joins are going to be. So if they're not going to be efficient, then that can push you back towards um, denormalization. Um, triples are an option. And then because it's kind of a, a nuanced, sort of subjective, matter of opinion type question, um, it's good to kind of consult with your peers rather than doing this in a vacuum. If you're working with MarkLogic Consultancy, speak to them. Um, we've got, we, we, we monitor Stack Overflow as a channel, so you can sort of post your questions up there, and you'll usually find this pretty sort of swift turnaround with respect to a response. Um, so the, the, the third and final query is this query here, and... I'm not going to sort of go through the fine detail of it, but you should kind of be able to see from the top that essentially what we're doing is we're bringing in um, the, the, the actor data. So, first thing to do 
which is an easy thing to forget, is to get rid of the film data, because I'm essentially creating a new set of film documents. Okay. And then I'm going to go back to Eclipse. Um, and just zoom that up a little bit. And the same thing that you've seen previously, um, the only thing that's really changing is the scoping query. It's still a film document, same security information, um, still going into the Sequila collection. Um, okay, so... attention. Um, right, so that is now finished. So come over here, uh, get rid of that, do a refresh. So I have the same thing that I had previously, but the key difference now is that if I want to see all the films that Uma Wood has been in, then I can just do that. Um, and I get, so this is a, a demo application, so, you know, you would, uh, if you spent time on it, you'd have something that looks more sophisticated, I guess. But we get more than one document, right? That's the crucial thing. Uh, so we get 36, as it happens. One of those is the active document itself. And then hopefully I'll pick on um, one that isn't. And this tells me that Uma Wood was in um, a film called Splendor Pattern. So these, these are entirely made-up names. And you can see, hopefully... Um, Right at the bottom there, um, Umawood's Umawood details. Okay, so what did we just do? Um, we did three different migrations. We did a very sort of simple load as is. Um, then in the second migration, we did um, some denormalization. And we followed a specific pattern, which was the denormalization of lookup data, um, which, if you will, is a sort of slightly more mechanical mi migration. So it makes, it makes sense to do that. You don't need to kind of consult, etc., to work out whether or not that's the right thing to do. And then finally, we did um, some more extensive denormalization, which, you know, perhaps made, you know, we did the thing that made most sense within the context of our application development. Um, and if you're doing a migration of any substance, um, more than likely, you know, what you will use all of these, all of these techniques because you're going to have many-to-many -many relationships, one-to-many, and, um, and the other one, if it has a name. Um, some practical advice. Uh, so migrations in the real world. Um, so data migration is not necessarily the sort of sexy end of application development. Um, so usually people are building a search application for the first time, so they kind of want to get into that and get some results. Um, the other things that, I guess, motivate people are charting and visualization and all that sort of thing. Um, but we would recommend, and it's sort of a, a general kind of life lesson, right, do, do the things that you don't sort of necessarily um, want to do. The reason for doing migration early on is that it will probably save you having to go back and, and refactor later. So don't sort of go, go down the route of creating fictitious data um, or imagining your data. Another very good reason for doing the migration early on is that when you show your application to stakeholders, they're going to see something that looks realistic. And if they see something that looks realistic, then they're, they're going to go away with a much warmer feeling than if they go away thinking this doesn't actually you know, dovetail with my understanding of, of anything, pretty much. Which probably, in turn, is you know, going to make your life easier by way of uh, additional um, motivation. Um, and what you should have seen, or hopefully seen, by this sort of small talk, is that when you're bringing data into MarkLogic, um, it enables you to work in a very agile manner. So what we did was we, we brought some data in, you know, we, we, we tweaked it a bit, we went back. And we, went, we only went around that circle once, but we could go around it multiple times. Um, and this can fit with the agile paradigm um, if you factor some testing in it, just to make sure that whenever you make a change, you're always you're always going forwards. So, you know, a sort of a, a message, I guess, that you know, we'd sort of like to get across is that working with MarkLogic will allow you to work in this sort of agile, 
iterative way and what you won't have to do is, is do a lot of upfront analysis and you won't kind of be paralyzed by that and you know you spend three months before you've sort of got anything to, to show for it you're getting results straight away which is kind of usually usually a good thing um, so final thing I'm going to talk today is talk about today is BI tools um, so I guess any significant relational system will probably have BI tools attached to it and um, things like click view or Tableau or Cognos. And an important consideration when considering migrating to a new platform is, well, what about the people who are already using the system? You know, what's going what's to happen to them? So the people who are building the dashboards and creating the reports, like number one, they're going to want those reports to carry on working. And number two, they're going to want to carry on creating reports and dashboards, etc. Um, and as it happens, we do have a sort of solution for that, which is why I guess I'm talking to you about it. Um, we'll be making use in this brief demonstration of the MarkLogic ODBC capability. And one of the things you will sort of hear about um, in the next two days is the extent to which we, we're enhancing this in MarkLogic 9. And there's a su substantial amount of innovation going on there. But right now, in the core of the product, there's quite a lot that will sort of help you in this regard. And, and so a quick demonstration will hopefully um, help you help you see that. So I'm going to go over to MarkLogic Query Console. Um, and what I can do right now is I can create um, a film view. And um, you can think of this as being like a, a kind of column-based, database way of doing things. So to create a view, I create indexes. And then a, a view is essentially a collection of indexes. Um, so once I, I do that by this relatively small amount of code, which I'm not going to sort of talk you through, is I can write you know, the sorts of SQL queries that we all you know, know and love. So um, I can write something like this. Um, let me just blow it up just a little bit. Uh, will it let me know when? Uh, so I don't quite know how to move it. I'll read it, if you can't read it at the back. It's a select star from film where rating equals PG. And when I do that, I get all the films that have um, a rating of PG. So, you know, and then the ODBC part of the ODBC capability will expose that data to applications which understand ODBC, which is pretty much all BI tools, right? And then it extends to things like Excel or indeed Access if you want to um, access um, your data from there. Um, important point is just because you kind of can do that doesn't mean, you know, you sort of should in a sense. So if you just push your data into Mark Logic and then use SQL to get it out again, then you, you know, the question is, well, what have you actually achieved by doing that? But the, the, you know, the important thing is that, you know, you're not leaving people behind, you're letting people do exactly what they did before, but you're also getting access to, like, a whole range of, of, of new features, some of which I mentioned. Other people will talk about them in other sessions, right? So I'm not going to, like, enumerate them another time. Another time. But there's, there's a lot of stuff in Mark Logic that you do not get in SQL Server or Oracle that will let you build, you know, exciting, useful, and imaginative um, applications. Okay, um, so summarizing sort of what we've talked about today. So the kind of motivating idea was having this, you know, like data silos or cylinders of excellence, as they're sometimes referred to, bringing them all together um, in one place. Um, if we want to do that, then the sort of things we need to do are think about the entities, uh, design the appropriate data model, and on a practical side, we can work in an agile manner um, if we're using MarkLogic as our platform. And then if we go through all of the above, we will realize the benefits of documents in an operational, transactional, enterprise, NoSQL database, which in sort of shorter language means that you can do far more things than you were doing previously with all the confidence that you were doing things previously. And uh, that concludes the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, there will be some Q&A. So um, I don't know what, how we're doing in terms of time, because um, my phone helpfully locked five minutes in. But I'm not getting a hard stare. So I've got another five minutes. I don't know. I should keep talking. Um, so yes, uh, Q&A. Uh, is, there a, is there a mic? Or if there's not, people can just put their hands up. Gentleman in the front row. Um, so the very what the so oh right 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 yeah. yeah so I guess if you search for Mark Logic and Sakila you should find it um, and it was it was authored by a colleague of mine Rob Rudin um, 
So that's another useful pointer. Okay. Gentleman on my left. Um, uh, sorry, my Earlier on in the, the keynote, um, uh, we talked about the ability to um, import data and then not have to run re-import. So you can work with the data in Mark logic. Yep. Um, essentially removing the ETL process um, that you might have seen in, in SQL days. This kind of feels like you're suggesting that iterative process still has a place. Is there a, another pattern for doing integration where you get all of the data dumped in Mark Logic and then work on it once it's inside Mark Logic to change the format of it? Right, you could definitely transform it within Mark Logic. That would, that would be another way of doing things. And you could build, you know, you, you, could, you could do that in any number of different ways. Um, so it's pretty much the case that for any one activity Mark Logic, there's now approximately you know, five different ways of doing it, but you could do it via X query, you could do it via server side JavaScript. You could do it from without, you could program it from the Java client, and you could do it externally via JavaScript. So the short answer is yes. And there is, as I sort of noted, there's extensive support for transformations, which is really what you're talking about. So, so yeah, I mean, it would probably actually be um, less time consuming, more likely, what to actually process the data once it's, once it's in. Um, for the purposes of this demonstration, it's probably simpler to show it in the way that I've shown it. But, you know, yeah, you could... I guess one slight point is that you'd be stitching together pieces of a pipeline if you did that, right? So you brought it in, then you do something, and then you do something. And then, it, you know, when you come to sort of do it for real, right, you've got to make sure that you actually, you know, go through those same steps. So there's a slight argument in favour of always going back to brush tax. I mean, when I've, when I've done migrations previously, my, my harness usually just works with the raw data, to be quite honest, and then I'm updating the actual process that... that that pulls in. But you but you can, so you've got you know got options, which is always the good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, you can make use of enumerations. So there's a lot of mechanisms in Mark Logic which um, allow you to ensure data integrity, um, but also you've got like, data freedom at the, at, the, at the same time. So it's a bit like a sort of you know a liberal sort of society that there are you know there. Are, um, so the, so uh, so one one mechanism is to sort of only offer users fixed choices. For example, um, you can make use of schema to ensure those sorts of constraints, right? And so you can make use of XSDs. Um, you could enforce it programmatically. So if you um, manage your data always through an API, then it actually limits what's happening to a sort of subset of operations. So, um, so yes, there are definitely ways of ensuring, um, ensuring that type of constraint um, is, is observed. And, and there's, there's quite a lot of ways. In, in honesty, there's that's three. Yes? Yeah, the <coughs> film example you gave is pretty much the ideal Right. And there's kind of a fun article that you might have read by the person who's technically the diaspora that goes through the difference between the film database and then actually having a model that is relation strong, such as a social network where you have relations between people are more important than a script hierarchy that you get from the film database. So, for example, with this, if you were to search for all the films that I know, Colin Darcy was in, how Colin comes a little bit back to this lookup question and, and the, the integrity of data. But it would, it's interesting to me when you have a relation model and, and in an organization, it's, you can just think of somebody who reports to somebody who reports to somebody who's in a virtual team who's run by somebody else. A lot of data we have simply has relations and we need to ensure the integrity of those relations and record those relations. The key question I have around Mark Logic is this a still a good use case for Mark Logic, or is it somewhere relational is better? And it, can you always substitute these kind of relations with semantics and it works very well? Or are there some trade offs there? It's a, it's a good example. You show that the basically the approaches, but I'm trying to work out the use cases where Mark Logic is really good, and perhaps there are other use cases where a relational model is, is better, and you should keep the data there. And if you are going to move it to Mark Logic, how do you? Handle things like relations, which you do need in some models. 
Right. Yeah, it makes, it makes perfect sense. So I guess, you know, what we've worked with today has been chosen to fit into a sort of 40, 50 minute slot. And it's not necessarily massively reflective of what you might encounter in the real world. Nevertheless, hopefully it is true that sort of some of the, um, the general principles do, do apply to a certain extent. So I think, um, slightly paraphrasing your question is, are there you know, maybe scalability limits to actually modeling relationships in mock logic? Would that be a fair sort of summary of what you're saying? Or how are there well does mock logic handle relationships when you do need to handle relationships? Um, how do you best handle them? Right, do you, so... Do you just Right. Well, I guess sort of proof, proof by non-existence to a certain extent. So I, I can't recall a time where somebody has proposed a certain set of relationships being necessary to their application and having to turn around and saying, well, we, we just can't do that. Right. So I don't, I don't necessarily think there's any sort of limiting factors. I think that probably at some sort of mathematical level, you can probably show that all these various things are actually equivalent. So I guess the, 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 the questions slightly become non-functional questions. So, um, so agility is definitely a a consideration, you know, the, the, the ease with which you can, you can do something. Um, the, the manageability, um, the ability to actually comprehend what's going on. Um, and then you can have, the, the question is, well, given these two platforms, which of these sort of fulfills these non-functional goals best for me? Um, and you can't say in all cases it will be kind of one or another. I think um, the agility claim actually holds up pretty well for Mark Logic. And I think, you know, we're all familiar with the schema diagrams that show, like, the schema diagrams that don't fit on a single piece of paper, right? So you can argue that there are sort of scalability limits within the relational database. And you definitely, you know, you will reach the point where you, you badly need to refactor. Um, and a slight point that I missed out, actually, that I, I, I meant to say was that um, when bringing data into Mark Logic, one thing that customers often do is they take the opportunity to rationalize their data because it's become like, become like an overgrown garden. And, you know, that's the sort of, a slight sort of dark side of relational that that's definitely where you can where you can get to so um i mean in answer to the question are there sort of scalability limits we don't we don't believe you know we don't believe so i mean any any tool has to be used wisely but if um if it is used wisely i think our general view is that you will get a result that you that you will be happy with which is a sort of very qualitative um, complete you know answer that can't be substantiated in any um, well, it's not really. No, it's not actually an independence. It's, it's an answer which actually has a certain amount, of, a reasonable amount of certainty in it. But it's quite, it's quite difficult to evidence. But I think it, you know, it can handle models of arbitrary, arbitrary complexity. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the freedom which will allow, will allow you to sort of continue to update your model fairly readily, whereas you possibly run into a quagmire earlier with a sort of traditional relational schema because you can't unpick that stuff. It's very, very rigid. So I hope that answers the question. Um, a couple of questions. One is, you had an order by clause on one of the queries retrieving data from the source. Is that relevant at all? Oh, very well observed. Um, I, I don't think it is, no. And the second one was, the keynote speeches seem to be all about, you know, don't worry about the source data. You can suck it in and take care of all of that. But the way to do that is define the relationship between that and the terms and the way to define them. Right. Is that true in, in the real world? Well, I mean, I think the truth is that nothing works by magic, right? So, uh, uh, you know, promises of, promises of silver bullets are sort of empty promises by and large. Um, you know, you're going to have to do a certain amount of work when building an application. You can't just sort of buy something, plug it in, and it'll do the work for you. So, I mean, this is, I think, I haven't actually heard the keynotes, um, but, but one of, I think the, the message that we're promoting, as I understand it, and um, we'll see the folks and me in the room will sort of correct me if I'm wrong, is that Mark Logic promotes agility, right? So it lets you do this um, in, a more, in a more painless and, and rapid way than you might do, do it. And, and it will, you know, it will involve some analysis, right? Um, abs absolutely. And this talk is probably the next level down from that. But what you won't have is the traditional like three months of analysis in creating, in creating schemas. So I know when I've built applications, you know, on SQL Server, for example, I've, you know, I've spent a lot of time working out the data model, whereas Smart Logic kind of lets you sort of skip that step, um, you know, and sort of just get into build, getting into building your application.
extend that scale, given that you don't have to pay those scale. Right. I mean, I guess if, if, you, if you put somebody who's not qualified to do something in charge of some, you know, that thing that they're not qualified to do, then you're going to get a result which is not, you know, not a very good result. So if you don't, you know, you need to continue to approach things in a, in, in a, in a rigorous manner, which is good news for all of us in this room, otherwise we'd all be out of jobs, right? So, um, so, so yes, but I think that, you know, it's, it's about the agility. You should be, you know, you should record what you do. You obviously, obviously need to think about, you know, the people who work on your application after you. But MarkLogic will support, um, you know, doing things in, intuit in an intuitive way. So I guess that, you know, the, the short examples that we saw are a good example of that. So film data, it's not sprinkled around the database, and I need to know it's in this magic table here. It's just it's all in my film document, you know, so it, perhaps it makes the manageability and the clarity um, better than it might have been in your previous system. But I mean, it's a, you know, it's, it's, a fair, it's a fair question. You could, you know, it doesn't matter how good the tool, you can always do things badly. Right, okay. Okay. All right.